Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, it's an honor to have you all. This uh, this will be a, a new year, and uh, in this new year, we have we're starting off with the bang for Grand Rounds. This can be considered our education uh, subspecialty uh, Grand Rounds for the year. Uh, we have a, a special guest, uh, Dr. Steve Flynn, who I'll introduce in just one moment. Um, he will actually be followed uh, by a potpourri of the passionate educators here. Um, the educators, not not only our faculty at Moran, as you know. Uh, this will be led by uh, Catherine Hu, uh, Ariana Levin, uh, amongst others, uh, and then we'll be wrapped up in the end by Marissa La Rochelle, who will be speaking about some of uh, our new initiatives on feedback. So uh, just, uh, again, a little bit of uh, bookkeeping. Uh, Omicron is uh, among us, and we are continuing to have um, residents, fellows, uh, et cetera, who are testing positive. Again, please, uh, please recognize that, that we are always aware when they do test positive. We certainly rely on you all uh, to arrange schedules. Uh, please let us know what type of resources you need. Uh, the, the, of course, priorities are covering uh, consults and VA, and so there may be some trading, and we do ask for your flexibility, and thank you for that uh, ahead of time. Uh, so without further ado, it's an honor to uh, introduce a fellow ophthalmic educator, uh, Dr. Stephen B. Flynn, uh, MD, PhD. Uh, he completed his medical school at LSU Shreveport, uh, did, uh, and also his PhD at the University of Cincinnati. He has a full-time appointment with LSU Shreveport Ophthalmology Department. He staffs satellite clinic at an affiliated hospital. Uh, he also sees and supervises senior resident clinic and uh, residents in the operating room. In terms of didactics, he's responsible for teaching optics, refractive surgery, uveitis at his program. In a previous life, he taught psychology at the collegiate level. His PhD is in uh, cognitive uh, psychology. Uh, and, and the thing that I really have been uh, most impressed with in my time and in interactions, uh, Steve is a, a forward thinker, very progressive in his thought process about how we educate, uh, how we can do it um, more comprehensively uh, and in a more innovative way. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Flynn, welcome to Salt Lake City. Uh, we are all ears and excited to he hear you present. Thank you, Dr. Petty. Can everybody hear me okay? Audio is great. All right, well, it is uh, wonderful to be with y'all this morning. I am Steve Flynn, and let me see if I can figure out how to advance the slides here. Okay, all right. So as Dr. Petty mentioned, I am on the faculty at LSU Shreveport. I work in a satellite clinic about 100 miles east down I-20. So I thought a map would help. Uh, and I am, as he said, comprehensive by training. So. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to say that the reason I am speaking to you this morning is that I am a candidate for a faculty position here at Moran I. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, what makes this guy a candidate? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty strong comprehensive ophthalmologist, but there are a lot of strong comprehensive ophthalmologists between here and Monroe, so I don't think that's why. Uh, rather, I think it's because Dr. Petty and Dr. Olson see in me someone who may be able to contribute to the pivot in your curriculum that you began about a year and a half ago when you started uh, moving from the sort of attending-centered traditional lecture model of the resident uh, didactics to a resident-centered uh, interactive reverse classroom approach. And specifically, the way I might be able to contribute to that is that I'm the author of a fairly comprehensive set of ophthalmology didactics material that is currently hosted online by the Academy. All right, so this slide is my cue to go to Google. I invite everyone to go with me if you'd like, open a tab. And if you'll type in OCAP review into your Google search bar, and then my slides come up first, followed by the Moran core. All right, so clicking on that, and here we are at the website. <laughs> yes, we accept. Okay, so scrolling down a little bit, we see a bunch of tabs. These tabs are organized roughly like the board books. So first we have basic optics, and there you open that up. Each of these are individual slide sets cornea, and 
There are about 290 slide sets in total, uh, about 30,000 slides, give or take a few. I'm the sole author. All the slides that were reviewed by the Academy before they went live. There are, uh, there are no barriers to access. You don't have to be a member of the Academy. There's no fees involved. You don't have to register, no pop-up ads. Anybody from across the country and around the world can access them. Continuing to open these up here. I have no financial interest in the slides. The Academy didn't pay me anything for them and they don't pay me anything for my ongoing activities. I'm constantly revising slide sets, uh, adding new ones on occasion. Continuing to click through, we're, we're down to retina and vitreous. We're in uh, alphabetical order here, by the way. And uh, while we're here in retina vitreous, let me call your attention to a, sled, a set, excuse me, concerning uh, arm corn and CMV. The reason for this foreshadowing will be apparent in a couple of minutes. And last, but definitely not least, we have uveitis. And again, while we're here, may I point out that there's a toxo slide set, there's a syphilis slide set, here's TB, toxocariasis, endogenous endophthalmitis, and bartonellosis. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my slides now. Uh, if you'd rather stay and sort of peruse the website and just sort of half listen to me, that, uh, that's fine by me. Okay, so the slides went live, the, the, the site that is about a year and a half ago, a little longer, early 2020. And it, it just gives me great pleasure to say that the response from residents has been overwhelming. Uh, the comments you see here, these are from unsolicited emails from residents, and these are pretty typical of the of sort of the response I've got. It's just been really, really gratifying, gratifying to see how well uh, residents have responded. Apparently, these slides work really, really well as far as uh, the residents are concerned. So. Why is that? What is it about the slides that sort of allows them to be so effective? Well, again, if we look into the comments, the feedback I've received, uh, once again, these are unsolicited uh, comments, uh, it's the format. And the format is what I call, uh, for lack of a better term, conversational Q&A. And I call it that uh, to separate it, to distinguish it from traditional Q&A. Of course, traditional Q&A is there's a, there's a stem, all of the following are true about keratitis, except and then there are, you know, say four or five choices, you won't find that kind of question and answer in the slide sets. Instead, the slides are, uh, uh, for the most part, uh, organized like a, a conversation, if you will, uh, a relaxed conversation between an attending and a resident. So there's the topic at hand, whatever it may be, and the attending is asking the resident questions, probing her knowledge of the topic, of course, the resident answers almost all the questions correctly. Uh, occasionally, the tables are turned and the, the resident is asking the attending to clarify some topic or another. On rare occasions, the, the uh, uh, interlocutors will break through the glass and, and ask me, or Dr. Flynn, a question, and I will on occasion uh, ask them a question. But uh, for the most part, it's uh, like two people talking. and. Uh, the, this structure, this format uh, goes on and allows me uh, throughout the course of a time set, uh, excuse me, a slide set to, to construct, to frame out the topic at hand and then to, uh, to fill it in with the, uh, with the facts that the resident needs to know to, uh, to understand that topic. And, and uh, apparently it works really well. Okay, pardon me one second. All right, so I claimed earlier that uh, I could contribute to Moran's pivot from the traditional uh, model to the reverse classroom. And the reason I say that is I think the slide sets are an ideal resource for a, the sort of curriculum that you are implementing here at Moran. I imagine that one sort of impediment or roadblock or at least speed bump you run into in implementing your reverse classroom approach is a dearth of appropriate resources. And that's not surprising 
because uh, I imagine, again, that most of your faculty, all of whom are excellent educators, have spent their entire lives developing didactics along the traditional models. So they created didactics that uh, presumed that they, the educator, would be standing in front of a group of residents and they would be presenting about the topic. Uh, but that's not what you're doing now. So what are those educators supposed to do? Well, they have all this didactics material that was created for this one model, and now you're, you've adopted a different model. They can't simply hand you their, their lecture notes and say, well, okay, here it is, learn it on your own. It's just not very effective. You need something that was developed with independent self-directed learning in mind, and that's exactly what my slides were uh, created for. Okay, let me show you an example of how this might work. So here is a, a screen grab from the Moran website that you all recognize. It is the posterior infectious uveitis uh, lesson plan that Dr. La Rochelle created and uh, was gracious enough to put online. Uh, before I go any further, Dr. La Rochelle, are you with us today? She may not be able to unmute yet. I'll, I'll, um, there yes, she, I'm yeah. here. I, uh, nice to meet you and thanks again for creating your lesson plan and sharing it with everyone. I hope, I hope we get a chance to, uh, to talk to meet later on. Okay, so uh, he, again, Dr. La Rochelle has uh, selected posterior infectious uveitis as her, her lesson plan. I think we can all agree on two things about posterior infectious uveitis. Uh, one is it's an extremely important topic. And two, it is a challenging one. It's one that when residents encounter it, especially junior residents, uh, they, they find it daunting to, to say the least. And um, right here in the beginning of her lesson plan, we can see why. Here is where she lays out sort of the, uh, the topics involved in infectious posterior UVS. And, and by my count, she has identified uh, about, about 18 entities that she felt were important enough to point out by name, and that's a lot, but I'd like you now, and here was a point of that foreshadowing earlier, take a look at the, uh, the topic she ident she's identified and think back to the website. If you cross-reference the two, you find that I have material, and I say material, pretty extensive material, covering all of her topics except one. With apologies, Dr. La Rochelle, I have nothing for you regarding uh, the West Nile virus. So you can see that should she choose to, Dr. La Rochelle could take the slides and assign them to the residents as pre-work. And the residents could then use those slides on their own, on their own time and in their own manner to, to drill down on whichever ones of these, uh, one or, or all of these topics that Dr. La Rochelle felt uh, needed doing so. All right. In addition, if you look at the, the classroom portion of her uh, lesson plan, you see that she's going to start with a short quiz uh, to assess the resident's knowledge of the pre-work. Conveniently, all my slide sets are question and answer format. So whether or not Dr. La Rochelle decided to use them uh, prior to the classroom, she could always use them as a resource, uh, as a, text, a test bank, if you will, to draw out uh, questions and answers that she could use in her, uh, in her quiz. Okay, so let's take a look at some slides. And again, we're gonna draw our inspiration from, from her, uh, her lesson plan. And I noted that in the assigned pre-work, uh, despite the fact that there were 18 entities identified uh, by name in the topic section, she singled out one, Bartonella, for, you know, this is the one you have to review. So I'm gonna take that to mean that she felt Bartonella was especially important. So let's take a look at some slides on Bartonella. Now, uh, all are question and answer format. So the plan had been for all of you to be here with me today and I would throw out the questions and maybe y'all would shout out the answers. Uh, that is not really practical unless Megan and Ethan, are y'all are y'all feeling good about Bartonella? Maybe, no, no, okay, all right. So we won't do that then. Um, so I'm going to play both roles. I'm gonna ask a question and I'm gonna get the answer. I'll, I'll pause a, like a half a beat uh, to give you a, a chance to think of an answer. Of course, you're, you're gonna read the question much, fa much faster than I ask it. And that's an important point. These are intended, the, the intended consumption method 
she is a resident reading them to uh, him or herself. Uh, so when we go through them, it'll be much slower than it would actually be for a resident. Uh, but uh, okay, here we go. So what is the cause of organism in Bartonellosis? That is Bartonella hensleyae. And what sort of organism is it microbiologically speaking? Well, it's a bacterium. And specifically, and here the, the resident is prompted to come up with rod versus cocci, and it is a rod. And is it gram positive or negative? It is gram negative. Here's a, a picture of it. How are humans infected or infected via the bite, lick, or scratch from a cat, especially a kitten? And what is the common name for Bartonellosis? Well, we call it cat scratch disease. And now I'm going to skip ahead. I got some more. This slide will continue with some demographics who's at risk, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, skipping ahead, how does cat scratch disease present? First, there's a focal something. And the, the, the point of a question like this is that for the resident to come up with that one key word that may show up, say, on the OCAP or the written qualifying exam, that key word that will cue in the resident, aha, what we're talking about here is Bartonellosis. And that key word is vesiculopustular. It's a vesiculopustular rash that appears at the inoculation site. And there's a picture. Followed by, so here we have some amount of time later, and we want the resident to be able to pull this up. Are we talking hours, days, weeks, months? Uh, and then there's gonna be another key finding. And again, it's something that's so important. We want the resident to be able to pull that word up specifically. So a couple of weeks later, regional lymphadenopathy develops and followed by, or excuse me, accompanied by a flu-like severe. And here's just some lymphadenopathy. So what percent of patients will go on to develop ophthalmic involvement? It's not that many, but it's still, a, it's still enough for us to be quite concerned about five to 10%. And what is the most common ophthalmic manifestation? Now, this is where the lecture may go a little sideways for some residents, because of course the answer is neuroretinitis, but no, it's not neuroretinitis. The answer is paranoid oculoglandular syndrome. Now, what are the two hallmarks of paranoid oculoglandular? It's a unilateral something conjunctivitis. We're looking for a histology here. And the answer is granulomatous. And here is a picture of a granulomatous conjunctivitis secondary to POS. Now, granulomatous conjunctivitis is a distinctly uncommon entity. And what two histologic forms are vastly more common? And that would be papillary and follicular. And the point here is to get the resident to situate, to contextualize the conjunctivitis associated with paranoid glandular with what they already know about conjunctivitis. And also to reinforce the fact that you know, we always talk about papillary and follicular conjunctivitis, but there is this other form, granulomatous, that needs to be uh, uh, borne in mind. And then we extend that a little bit. Okay, so when you hear granulomatous conjunctivitis, two entities should come to mind. The first is POS. What is the other? And if I forced you to guess on a granulomatous condition affecting the eye, you would probably get this right. It is sarcoid. Sarcoid can, not always, but can cause a uh, granulomatous conjunctivitis. All right, and now we're pivoting back to where we were. So the other hallmark of paranoid ocular glandular is ipsilateral something lymphadenopathy. And what we're looking for here, as you can see, is location, specifically two locations. So, and is ipsilateral, preauricular, and or submandibular lymphadenopathy. And here we have a picture of a child with a uh, fairly massive uh, submandibular lymphadenopathy associated uh, with their with their paranoids. Okay, so wait a minute, what about the other signs and symptoms? The impaired upgaze, lid retraction, nystagmus, and uh, light near dissociation. No, no, those are the signs and symptoms of paranoid syndrome, not paranoid ocular glandular system, uh, excuse me, syndrome. And this is a question that I think is really important, especially for the junior residents, interns, medical students, because uh, quite often we, and I'm referring to more senior residents, faculty, we use the word paranoid as a shorthand. I have a patient with a paranoid syndrome, or I, I just have, I have a patient with paranoids. And we know in context which of these we're referring to. 
But for someone who is listening, uh, they may get the impression that paranoid just means this one thing. So I want to extend the, the word paranoid, show that it has these different meanings so they can be forewarned about that. And while we're on the subject, just a question or two, where is the lesion in paranoid syndrome? That's the dorsal midbrain. We'd also accept pretectile nucleus uh, as an answer here. And do paranoid syndrome and paranoid oculoglandular syndrome have anything to do with each other? And the answer to that question is, other than being described by the same physician, Henri, uh, no, they don't have anything to do with each other. All right, now I am skipping over. I had a further discussion of, uh, excuse me, of uh, paranoidocular glandular in terms of other organisms that can cause it, et cetera. I invite you to look at the, uh, the slides that on the, uh, on the website uh, if you're uh, interested. So skipping down to what is the other common ophthalmic manifestation, that's neuroretinitis. But before we discuss Bartonello, uh, Bartonello neuroretinitis, <laughs> neuroretinitis specifically, pardon me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's review posterior uveitis more generally. Okay. First, backing up another step, what are the four basic anatomic locations in which uveitis can originate? Well, that would be anterior, intermediate, posterior, and panuveitis. Which location is most likely to manifest you know, uveitis from Bartonella? And that is the posterior segment. Drilling down now on posterior uveitis, what are the four posterior inflammation locations? Well, it can be primarily in the choroid, primarily in the retina, in the choroid and retina, or the optic nerve and retina. And if it's primarily in the choroid, we call that a choroiditis. If it's primarily in the retina, it's a retinitis. If it's in both, it's a chorioretinitis or a retinochoroiditis. And if it's the optic nerve head and, and the retina, we call that a neuroretinitis. Now, before we go on, some of you are thinking, wait a minute, this is too basic. Well, for most of the people on this uh, Zoom, it is too basic. But for uh, a medical student, for an intern, this could be revelatory. It could be for them going, aha, now I get it. So having it, it's challenging to create a review material that's aimed at both senior residents and, say, interns. It's like trying to teach a meaningful math lesson to first graders, eighth graders, and high schoolers. You just can't do it where every aspect of a lesson is, uh, is a nugget, a pearl for every person watching. So in my experience, what the senior residents do when they get to a part like this is they fast forward. They go, huh, yeah, 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 yeah. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. So this format makes fast forwarding very simple. They just go right through, skip the slides. They see the slides are skipping until they get to the slides they feel they need to review. So the... Yes, this material is basic, but it doesn't uh, provide an impediment to, uh, to senior residents in terms of their utilizing the slides. Okay, of these four forms, with which is Bartonella classically associated? It is neuroretinitis. What are some of the other causes of neuroretinitis? And I think this is an important topic to at least touch upon because all of us, I think, uh, or most of us who are non uveitis specialists, we hear neuroretinitis we think Martin, uh, Martinella and not much else. But in fact, the uh, differential for uh, neuroretinitis is fairly extensive. And so we want the resident to bear in mind that there are a number of other causes of this condition. Of these, of all those listed, which is the most common cause of neuroretinitis? Well, that is Martinella by a substantial margin. And what percent of cat scratch disease patients will uh, develop neuroret neuroretinitis. It's not very many. It's only just a few, one or two percent. And how will they? How will it present? What will they complain of? These patients will typically complain of acute unilateral decreased vision. What will dilated exam reveal? As you know, it reveals disc edema and macular edema with exudate distributed in a fashion that we call a macular star. And we have a nice picture of a macular star. Which layer of the retina contains the exudates and thus is responsible for the macular star pattern? And this is one where there are sort of two answers. So we, we use the blank out technique here. It's the blank blank layer specifically, and then an eponym is what we're looking for in the second part. So that is the outer plexiform, specifically Henley's layer. 
And we have a picture of that just for those uh, interested or the residents who may need to review the basic anatomy here. In addition to neuroretinitis, how else can catch correction disease manifest in the posterior pole? The link can actually cause a focal or multifocal retinochoroiditis. And will slit lamp exam reveal other signs of inflammation? And typically, yes, there could be some anterior segment and uh, vitreous cell as well. Okay, so the set goes on from there to address Bartonellosis diagnosis and management, but we're gonna we're gonna bow out of it at this point. Okay, so if I join the Moran community, what could you expect? Well, you could expect that the slides would migrate from their current home on the Academy's website over to Moran's core. You could expect that I would be uh, available to assist Moran's faculty, those who wish to incorporate slide sets into their lesson plans. And by assist, I mean, of course, helping them find appropriate slide sets, but not only that, I'm happy to customize them. So maybe Dr. La Rochelle says, oh, Dr. Flynn, time out. That Martinella, love, love all that stuff. But as you know, I've got 18 entities I've got to cover. I don't have time for the residents to read all that stuff about ocular glandular. Can, we, can you cut it down for me and just give me some Bartonella slides that focus on neuroretinitis? Absolutely. Uh, or she might say, you know, you really, the West Nile virus is an important pathogen uh, with regard to infectious posterior uveitis. You would really be doing a service to our residents in particular and the ophthalmic community residents in general if you were to create a slide set concerning West Nile virus. Okay, I'm happy to do that as well. I can't do that quite as quickly as I can customize a slide set, but give me a little time and I can get that West Nile, uh, West Nile slide set created for you. You could also expect me to work with your curriculum committee as you continue your pivot, as you continue your reorganization around the reverse classroom uh, method. And you can expect me to be involved in resident and medical student teaching. I have taught uh, the medical student, you know, the intro to the eye exam lecture, et cetera, but that many times I enjoy it. I'm a uh, uh, one thing I do at my institution is when the, the first years go do the orbital dissection in gross anatomy, I, when my schedule permits, I will attend and sort of walk around the room and interact with the students while they dissect the orbit and answer clinical questions and answer the anatomy questions I can answer, which is not all of them. Uh, uh, in terms of teaching uh, residents, I'm very experienced in that as well. Um, my, my clinic is it's composed of me and one senior resident, and uh, he or she and I see all the patients. We have no other subspecialty help with us. I tell them it's, it's a, we're on an island over there. And so by doing that for the past 15 years, I've become pretty well versed in resident education. Um, I would also mention that uh, I elected to provide to, uh, to Dr. Olson for my, my three letters of recommendation are all from uh, former residents who have gone on to do fellowship. They've all completed their fellowship. They're all now out in practice. So uh, if any stakeholder wants to know what residents say about me vis-a-vis -vis being a teacher, uh, I would suggest that you approach Dr. Olson. Of course, those letters are, direct, are addressed to him. They're his letters to do with as you will, but there is information available to those of you who are interested in drilling down on, well, can this guy actually teach? And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, good goodness, Dr. Flynn, I'm, uh, I'm speechless. That is uh, an extraordinary amount of uh, material uh, dedication. You know, one thing I'll just say, if, if I was to try and describe, you know, what has made, you know, Moran what it is over the years, it's been uh, empowering passionate people to to do extraordinary things, and you know the, the fact that this is a passion you've had that you not only have had an idea, but then delivered and delivered and delivered over and over to create this. Um, it, it's certainly, I mean, it, it's it's exactly who we are, what we do, and uh, I, I have other thoughts. I'm going to actually uh, just you know mute myself here, let a few others chime in. Uh, I will take the conversation uh, for the next five minutes just to make sure we have time for other presenters. And then we can uh, have you um, at the end as well with any additional questions. Uh, Dr. Olson, I see you're unmuted. 
Steve, I think that's spectacular. What you've really created is an educational data set. And uh, we're, we're used to instead didactic lectures. You can find the same material, but it's very laborious uh, and, uh, and, and, and often trying to dive through that is consistent. So trying to go through, uh, take all the different literature and the rest, meld it down into a data set that people can logically go through, I think is a spectacular addition. And, I was also very impressed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If anyone would like to be unmuted, you can raise your hand. We have several, um, uh, Catherine and others who are co-hosts already that can unmute. Uh, I'll, I'll just make a comment. Um, uh, there's a book uh, called Make It Stick. It's sort of become the, the Bible for educators in higher education, particularly in medicine. Uh, and there they really outline how to create durable learning. Uh, you know, what, the difference between cramming for a test versus uh, what they um, argue really compellingly creates a durable long-term learning uh, is, is actually self-testing, uh, self-reflection, doing that at different intervals. Uh, in addition to that, uh, learning in a variety of ways, uh, hearing it, uh, doing a test. And then the, the really you know, exceptional thing here is uh, this is unlike anything I, I personally have seen. Uh, and it does allow residents to, uh, or really anyone to commit to an answer. And even if they're wrong, durable learning occurs actually equally uh, as well when they're wrong as when they're right in an answer. And um, in, in short, uh, I, as I think about my, um, you know, <laughs> coming up on renewing my um, ABO certification, uh, this is going to definitely be a tool that I use. Uh, Catherine, I see that you and both you and Rachel Patel uh, are live. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, we're happy to wait for other questions. We were just getting ready for our segment. And thanks so much for being here with us, Dr. Flynn. I'll make a very quick comment, which is just um, that this resource is incredibly helpful. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but uh, sneak preview that the uh, pre-work assignments for our lectures um, are something that um, we're talking about. How can we keep this fresh? How can we keep this new? And having a resource that's built in that offers the same degree um, of uh, interactive learning um, is something incredibly valuable that we don't really have as much to this degree and could be an amazing supplement to Moran Core. And it looks like uh, Dr. Degree has, uh, I think she's been unmuted. Kathleen. Yes, uh, this is Kathleen Degree, wonderful resource. Thank you, Dr. Flynn, for all your hard work. Um, uh, I was just having a question about your, uh, the licensing and copyright. Are, do you own your copyright? Do you um, uh, have a Creative Commons uh, statement? I, I just wanted to know kind of what, what type of agreement do you have for this wonderful work? Because this is a lifetime of work and uh, a life's work. Uh, I can truly see all your energy in this. It's uh, really remarkable. And thank you so much for presenting this today. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of copyright, I don't have a formal agreement with anyone. When the Academy and I were talking about whether they would host this, I asked the contact person, would I continue to own the slides? And they said, yes, the slides are still yours. You're not, you're not handing them over to us. We, the Academy, will not own them. Uh, but in terms of sort of holding on to them, if you will, and trying to control them, I decided early on not to do that. Uh, the slide sets are all downloadable. I, I have, uh, there's a short introduction on the website where I, I tell users, Feel free to download, use as you'd like. All I ask of you, user, is if you modify a slide set, keep it to yourself. Don't, don't distribute it. Just let my originals be out there, and you can use your modified slide set sort of in-house, if you will. But no, other than that, there's no, I have no agreements. No, there's nothing formal. And perhaps I should. I'm, I'm open to listening. Uh, from, uh, sounds like you know more about this sort of thing than I do. Well, I think, did Brandon Kennedy, uh, you're unmuted. I saw your hand go up. So, so Steve, we'll talk about that. Kathleen's the expert on this and uh, we'll talk about it. Okay, great. Yeah, hi everyone, this is Brandon. I'm one of the junior residents. Um, thanks Dr. Flynn for all your contributions. So I just had a quick question. I know myself and a couple other of us residents actually use your slides already. Um, my question is, is 
I primarily use them right now is like a supplementation or augmentation of the knowledge once I kind of acquire it from reading the BCSC. In your experience with residents, would you recommend using this as a primary source of learning, as in learning for the first time once you're seeing this material, or kind of plowing through these slides once you have a better grasp, um, so you can kind of move more quickly, almost like a, like it's like a Q and A format. That is a really good question, and it is one that I have wrestled with myself. Uh, my initial recommendation has been, and it's on the website, again, in that introduction, my recommendation is pick a topic, Bartonellosis, read about it in the board series, and then come to my slide sets. The feedback I'm getting from residents who write me is that a number of them have said, I have given up on reading the board books. I just use, pardon me, I just use your slides. I don't necessarily recommend that, but I also don't feel like I'm in a position to tell a resident, no, you, you can't learn that way. You have to learn this other way. So I'm, I'm a bit torn. Uh, one of the downsides to the slides I will point out is you have to have at least some fund of knowledge before you can use them. In other words, if someone is truly a neophyte, new to the field, well, their answer to every question is, I don't know. And it's not very useful for them. So if I could take just a minute, Dr. Petty, to show one other portion of the website, do you mind? Please do. Uh, while you pull that up, we'll just do the introduction uh, to our next group. Um, Dr. Catherine Hu, she'll be a, a cornea fellow with us next year. Uh, she'll be running the next portion. Uh, Rachel Patel, our current uveitis fellow, another passionate educator. And again, uh, they'll be bookended uh, by Marissa La Rochelle. Uh, while you do pull that up, I'll just share one um, wonderful thing about Catherine. Uh, in a very thoughtful uh, email early on match day for fellows, she sent her co-resident Marshall uh, a link uh, for from the SF match that uh, told him where he was going to match even before it was released. And it linked to a wonderful Rick Astley video of <laughs> never gonna let you down. So um, Catherine, you just uh, need that acknowledgement. Uh, Dr. Flynn, carry on, looks like you found it. I did, uh, you, you Rick rolled him, uh, excellent. Uh, That's it. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, two, I wanna make two comments if I could real quick. One. All the topics are standalone. So if you want to read about Bartonellosis, you have the Bartonellosis slide set. You don't need to read anything else to prepare you for the Bartonellosis slide set, except the optics. The optics are a tutorial. They're intended to take a naive uh, individual who knows nothing about optics step by step. In fact, they're called chapters. When you open them, they're not, they're, they're called chapters. So they're chapter one, two, three, et cetera. So by the time you finish the optics, you, the reader, the user, will have a good basic fundamental grasp of clinical optics. Are you ready to go out and, and refract? People know refraction still takes practice, but you are ready to uh, answer most of the sorts of questions that you're going to encounter on the OCAP. Okay, so I'd like to draw your attention to this section, new ophthalmologist overviews and basics. This consists of slide sets created with the intent of addressing the neophyte issue. In other words, people who truly know nothing about ophthalmology at, at, when they encounter them. This I'm thinking MS3s who decided they want to go into ophthalmology uh, or MS4s early in their career. So if we click on, on that, you'll see there are currently seven topics. These sets are not in question and answer format. These are narrative versions of the same slide sets that are in the main portion of the website. So in other words, when you read through these, you're not asked any questions. It's just, uh, you know, we can take a look, for example, let me open up the uveitis since we just did the uveitis topic. And you can see it, it starts talking about uveitis. There's no question and goes on, sorry, get it to cooperate here. Okay, so goes on, talks some more, identifies key layers of the eye. The material is also simplified a little bit. Some of the complexity has been taken out to make it more appropriate for a, a junior learner. And uh, I know you don't have time to read, but I'm clicking on the point is I'm showing you there are no questions here. It's just narrative. So this is exceptional. This is uh, this is 
Absolutely brilliant. I, uh, well, let's, let's do this. Let's take a little pause. I, there's a lot of synergies that are coming right now with this next portion and we're, we've left them kind of a perfect amount of time. Catherine, why don't you take it away and then uh, we'll come back to you at the wrap up in the end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course. Thanks, Dr. Flynn. Uh, let me just share my screen here. And this is just some visual aids here. Can everybody see my screen and um, yes. hear me okay? Oops, let me actually start from this slide. All right, everybody see the screen okay? Yes, we're good. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Flynn. This really uh, kind of rolls in nicely to just, we wanted to do a quick check-in for Mole uh, or Moran uh, Ophthalmology Learning Experience and also of course get Dr. Flynn's input as well. Um, but really we're 18 months into the rollout of uh, this new curriculum. Um, and we just wanted to kind of do a short check-in discussion. Um, and one of the um, kind of concerns or questions that we've had from faculty is really how to keep this material fresh every year. Um, you know, the first year, it was really, uh, really inspiring to see all the faculty uh, revamp their entire curriculum, make interactive activities, and come up with new ways to display and uh, really communicate their, um, their lectures. Um, but really, how do we keep this material fresh and updated? Um, and so we have some tips and uh, some, some resources that we can distribute to faculty. And then also we'll pivot at the end to go to Dr. La Rochelle on on-rotation feedback. Um, so to really start off, I wanted to see if Dr. Um, Rachel Patel is still online just to go over some of the uh, results from our faculty survey. We are doing um, kind of a research-based uh, approach with this as well. So take it away, Dr. Uh, Patel, and we can kind of go over the summary of these uh, results. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, so this credit to all of this goes to uh, every one of you guys um, for the faculty and for the residents for filling out the uh, copious amount of feedback that we requested over the last two years. Um, and as you know, we asked everyone to fill out a survey before, um, back in 2019, before even um, broaching the topic of uh, flipping classrooms to uh, this more interactive learning. And then we pulled everyone again more formally last June. So. This is a, a one year um, rather than a full 18 month uh, feedback, but I wanted to share with you guys what we've found so far. Um, so on the left, there's just a couple of the interesting, uh, interesting results um, that we found um, from the questionnaires. And um, this includes uh, how faculty felt um, that residents were participating during their didactic uh, time and with more of an interactive um, learning session, um, faculty felt that resident participation was up considerably. Um, we also know that this is not um, necessarily a, a natural way to teach, like people might be more comfortable with the traditional format, and that's very understandable. Um, but over after a year, um, the percent of faculty who said, oh, I'm definitely much more comfortable um, delivering lectures in the traditional format decreased with the year of experience. So we do know that this can be an acquired learned skill that people feel more comfortable with with time. So that's one good thing um, about uh, having um, this curriculum roll forward. Um, and residents also felt dramatically that this uh, flipped classroom method was much more effective in their learning um, than the traditional method. So um, on a scale of one to five, they rated it 1.8 for the traditional lectures and 4.8 for the flipped classroom. Yeah, okay, it's, it's subjective, but it is important that people feel so strongly about that. Um, but really what I wanted to focus on was what teaching methods people found effective, because this is what Dr. Flynn was talking about. Like, how can we make this um, something that, uh, what, what methods are working to improve uh, learner retention um, and resident engagement? And you can see from both a faculty and resident perspective that some of the um, methods were overlapping. So both um, felt that case-based learning was super helpful um, and an effective learning technique and quizzes as well. Peer-to-peer -peer teaching and team-based learning, which is a form of peer-to-peer -peer teaching where residents learn in teams um, and answer questions in teams are also something that both faculty and residents felt uh, helpful. Um, I wanted to draw your attention particularly to the oral board style uh, question, uh, response um, that the residents felt was effective. We didn't actually ask faculty, I forgot about that. So um, just to float this out there as an idea going forward uh, for fresh ideas, um, because this is something that might also be particularly suitable for um, Zoom learning, which is where we're at currently, um, where it is a form of case-based learning where everyone can see a picture of slides, um, but then there's one resident who like has the platform for three minutes, so there's not as much jumping about with Zoom and answers questions in an oral board style format. 
Um, so just to let you know what uh, faculty and residents think so far, and of course we can add to the list of things that are working. Um, uh, Moran Core and uh, Dr. Flynn's lectures are, are built to try to um, share the knowledge of what's working with other people so that everyone can uh, take that and roll with it uh, in, in their didactics. Great, thanks so much, Rachel. Um, and then at this point, I did want to kind of open it up to discussion, but I think we'll just uh, table this for the end of the uh, this segment. Um, but maybe just take a look at these questions, um, see if there's anybody who might want to raise their hand at the end of this uh, discussion. Um, but like I said, kind of some updated, uh, some ideas for updating session material, just speaking to faculty. Um, there are some Moran core resources that we'll just take a look at in a bit. There's also possibility from moving from a 12 month to more of an 18 month curriculum, for example, I know oculoplastics on their rotation and lecture roadmap have this format where there's a standing kind of uh, basic anatomy and basics of trauma uh, management that are um, given every year, but then there's also rotation of um, other pathologies and management that are rotated every other year, um, just so that again the material is new for um, the rotating classes. And then keeping uh, keeping track of uh, interesting cases in EPIC, this is something that I know Dr. Shakur uh, does and then also other fellows do. Um, is they have a shared list in EPIC where they can add interesting patient cases, um, good imaging and things like that, that I think can be uh, very, very useful. And of course, assigning residents pre-work can also be a, um, a way to update session material, have the residents bring in uh, in interesting cases to discuss. Um, and of course, just a friendly reminder to be sure to send out that pre-work with enough time in, in advance. Um, but also for a lot of the cases uh, that are oral or for a lot of the sessions that are oral board style, um, just updating those cases every year. Um, I know Dr. Lynn even had a ocular surface disease management uh, where she went through a case and next steps in management. And I think rotating those cases or changing them every year can be very, very fruitful. Um, and then I did want to also, um, these are some of the examples um, that we can look at uh, just while I'm pulling up the next um, the next display, but these are some things that other faculty have done. And really, we've really gained uh, national attention at AUPO and AAO. Um, a lot of faculty and other program directors have reached out to myself, Dr. Petty and Dr. Simpson. I'm really, really interested in this curriculum. It's, it's also a really um, a leading question that applicants for residency also ask us. Um, but I did want to just share a, um, a new screen here. If everybody can see um, for our Moran Core website. So um, on Moran Core, we have a section that is the Moran Ophthalmology Learning Experience. And we do have, again, instructional videos and support resources. Um, we're planning on um, putting more resources in terms of writing up specific lecture formats, just like you saw with Dr. La Rochelle's um, lesson plan so that other faculty can learn from other faculty. And we are planning to update this site. There's also instructional videos and one that I actually wanted to actually show. It's only three minutes long um, before we transition to Dr. La Rochelle's segment, um, but this is, uh, uh, a just a technology ideas and resources a video um, and I'll just play a, a segment of it here um, but it, it goes into specific uh, ideas and resources that you can do specifically for uh, unfortunately for zoom lectures and if we're gonna continue to have virtual lectures so I'm just going to play that here um, and let me see if I can optimize this for video video settings Let's see here hopefully that is um, let's see, optimize for video. All right. Hi, everyone. We hope rollout of the new curriculum. Can everybody hear the well sound okay? So Audio is great. And the audio is gone now, it looks like. It's showing your slide set again. Games and interactive platforms. And finally, some lesser Bye. known features on Zoom. This video is certainly not meant to be exhaustive, but more of an intro to some ideas that we hope you find helpful. We'll post a summary of topics in this video on our website. So first up, capturing screen images using a snipping tool on your computer may save you time instead of using a print screen function. I'm going to so skip through this one, systems, but it is on. Uh... can be a fun and easy way to make sessions interactive. So we'll be posting some free PowerPoint templates on our website. 
We'll also have links to some audience response systems. One of the favorite ones that we've had is Kahoot, which is a free online interactive quiz and audience response system. Residents can log on using a unique code using their smartphone to participate. You can see here during a neuro-ophthalmology lecture led by Dr. C and Dr. Redfern that residents can earn points, answering questions, and kind of promote some friendly competition. You can create an account for free on Kahoot.it, and creating a quiz is really easy. You just type in the question, and you can add any images or links or PowerPoint slides, and they have different formats of different types of questions that you may want to ask. And since Zoom will be in our lives for the foreseeable future when we can't have in-person lectures, a good way to simulate small group discussions is using the breakout function on Zoom. You can use this for case-based discussions and small group activities. Zoom has some pretty nice instructional videos that we will post on our website, but basically you as a host and organizer can actually break participants out into smaller virtual rooms and actually float between the rooms to see how the discussions are going. Another way to use Zoom is to pre-record lecture material that can supplement the pre-work you assign residents before the interactive Friday session. This can be an efficient way to convey important but straightforward material or provide updates with new material to supplement older lectures that have been posted already on Moran Core. Simply ask Ethan Peterson to send you a link to the University Zoom account for a recording. He can then help edit the recording if needed and post it to Moran Core with a shareable link like Dr. La Rochelle has done here. In summary, here are just a few ideas on how to incorporate technology into your flipped classroom sessions. We have assembled a list of helpful links and step-by-step -step descriptions covered in this video and more on our Moran Core website under support resources. Yeah. All right, so yeah, just like that video had said, we uh, have uh, pretty short digestible three minute videos on the site and then also a summary of um, you know pre work assignment ideas and then also how to use these certain um, you know pull everywhere audience response systems. And there's also another video on interactive um, interactive partner small discussion. Um, uh, activities as well. And there's an example in that video that I'm not going to show, um, but where Dr. Vigunta, sorry, I'm trying to move this bar from Zoom, um, but there's a uh, an example basically where uh, Dr. Vigunta and Dr. Krum had us pair up in discussion on Zoom, and then you would mute uh, you would meet the main Zoom session and then actually call your partner to kind of discuss the cases. So there are a lot of kind of creative ideas that are out there that we've also posted on uh, here as a reminder of the website. So uh, now I'm going to reshare my PowerPoint here. And um, we did want to pivot to Dr. La Rochelle. And um, I know that not all faculty give lectures, but all faculty definitely interact with uh, residents on rotation. So we did want to um, talk about some feedback forms that are that we are rolling out um so to make them more efficient and uh, effective making them timely personal and also personalized and also specific so i'm going to turn this over to her um, but it's something that we wanted to integrate to the experience for both faculty and also residents as well thank you can you guys hear me and see me okay audio is great Excellent. So thank you, Dr. Flynn, for showing us that really excellent resource. I mean, I think as attendings, um, we're trying to prepare the lectures in this new format. It's a little daunting because not only do we have to come up with these cre creative ways to impress the residents and, and occupy two hours of time face to face with this reverse classroom format, but we also have to prepare that um, the, the pre-work, which I found to be even more daunting to come up with, what do I want to tell, tell the residents to read ahead of time? And I think using your slides would, would be a really excellent way to cover that, that pre-work portion of it. So thank you. And this morning, I have the distinct pleasure of discussing one of everybody's least favorite topics, which is feedback. I was thinking feedback is a little bit like syphilis. No one likes to give it or receive it. And yet here we are with the incidents rising in every urban and academic center over the last decade. So with that, we are introducing a new, uh, this is funny, the only face I can see right now is Jeff Petty on my screen and I'm, I'm just cracking up. Um, so we're introducing a new resident feedback form that's supposed to be used as an on rotation, mid rotation feedback with the ultimate goal that 
In the same vein as our newly passed law, the No Surprises Act in medicine, that no resident will reach the end of their rotation and get a surprise feedback mentioning some horrendous flaw that they didn't know they were doing. And now it's the end of the rotation and they don't have time to remedy it. So the purpose of this is to have residents and faculty casually yet conscientiously engage in um, discussing areas of concern when they're still trying to address them. Let me just pull up the form here. And so we can, you know, imagine a resident awkwardly approaching an attending and the attending also awkwardly engaging in this, in this discussion. We know that feedback is really uncomfortable on, on both parties. Um, and we understand that I too cringe when I hear the word feedback, um, but we know it's important. It has its purpose. And when done well in a timely manner and constructive feedback can be, can be very helpful. Um, it's a reminder that as attendings in academics, our purpose isn't to critique or blissfully ignore residents on their path of training, but actually to create good ophthalmologists. And that takes effort and willingness. Um, and so, let me just pull this up. And while she's pulling that up, one thing that's really important is this feedback, just to stress, this is meant to be informal. That doesn't go in, a, in any permanent record. This really should allow for just some uh, more safe space to discuss, recognizing that you know this is the conversation that is in their forming stage, uh, not a final assessment or a formal feedback going uh, to, to, uh, to the education group. Okay, can you guys see that screen? Yes. This is what we came up with. Um, you'll notice the sort of normal areas that we cover, professionalism, clinical skills, surgical skills, and then consult. And importantly, we decided to have just two categories of below expected level or at or above expected level. So this really isn't where you're grading the residents and saying that they're you know, a nine out of 10 or an eight out of 10. We're just trying to really target areas of concern when there's still time to address them on the rotation. Um, and so this, like we said, is not a permanent part of their record. I think it, it's helpful to at least write a few sentences or mark some categories, but it doesn't have to be filled out in a very formal way. Um, but it's just a way sort of using it as a springboard to, to engage in that feedback during the rotation. And another helpful point of doing it at the mid rotation stage is that you can use this and simultaneously refer to the roadmap of what remind ourselves, what goals during the, the rotation that the resident should be learning. And so if you're looking at your roadmap per se in uveitis and a resident supposed to accurately grade anterior chamber inflammation or perform an Ozerdex injection, and we're at the halfway point of the rotation and you realize, well, I've never even asked this resident, how much AC cell have you seen? Or I've never seen them perform an Ozerdex. It can be a reminder to um, sort of reset where, where are the you perhaps are in engaging with the resident on their on rotation learning by referring to that roadmap. So um, with that, I'd like to open it up to feedback. I don't know that anyone's gonna give you feedback after <laughs> that. Uh, uh, you know. <laughs> yes, so, I was gonna let say. Me give, let me give feedback. <laughs> As somebody who's been involved in education for a long time, and very involved in it for much of my career, um, uh, less so lately. This is so much superior to what what typically happened and what was was we typically saw and involved in that. I, I just I just think it's a spectacular and obviously, it's a lot more work. <clears throat> I mean, we had I think one of our best lectures when I was a resident was uh, uh, Tom Pettit would just come in with a, a series of glass slides. We used to have those back then. And then uh, he would just pass them around and then people would say, well, what do you think's going on? And he'd talk about the case. And that, that was way better than the canned lectures. And this is so much superior to that. It is more work, but, but you, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. And so uh, that's where I see that this is going to be a much better learning experience. So just to add to that, and we are at time, um, this really came out of a lot of thought about how can we how can we you know foster communication and how can we get the right communication at the right time and you can see you know this is not an, an onerous tool this is simply a guide I could very much see someone looking at this 
just to guide a conversation as opposed to, you know, maybe even filling it out, filling it out with them, with the resident along the way. And please, uh, again, just we want to stress, this is this is just a moment for you for you to have a conversation with your resident on service uh, and help you uh, help them grow at uh, this time. This is not meant to be something where we're um, we're tracking, we're putting another portfolio, we're going to the clinical competency committee. Uh, and so, you know, I, I just want to again commend uh, all of the MOL committee. You can see all of their their names through all the educational resources. Rachel Simpson for really heading this. Uh, it's been an extraordinary transformation and one that. Um, if I didn't see it happening, I, I wouldn't believe that all this could be done. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Flynn. Uh, it was an honor, a true honor to have you today with us. And we, we are equally, um, equally impressed with uh, your passion, your resources, uh, and commitment to education. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful day.